She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming round the mountain, blowing steam off. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Riding six white horses when she comes. She'll be riding six white horses when she comes. She'll be riding six white horses. She'll be riding six white horses. She'll be riding six white horses when she comes. Oh, we'll all go out to meet her when she comes. When she comes. Oh, we'll all go out to meet her when she comes. When she comes. Oh, we'll all go out to meet her and we'll all be glad to see her. Oh, we'll all go out to meet her when she comes. everybody. Welcome. I'm Julie Slavinsky. I'm the director of events at Warwick's. And on behalf of Warwick's, we'd like to welcome you all to Jill G. Hall's launch event. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Warwick's before we start the main show. So for those of you that may be not from the San Diego area, Warwick's is located in La Jolla, San Diego, California. We are the oldest continuously family owned and operated bookstore in the country. So some of you that maybe live in San Diego may not have known that. So um, just wanted to give you a little bit about that. Uh, today, you're going to be able to participate by, if you have any questions for Jill, uh, go ahead in the comment section of Facebook. You can add those questions there. I'll be putting in how to order Jill's book, The Green Corset, uh, in that section as well. You'll be able to get signed copies from Warwick's. And while you'll be able to order the book, just simply click that. It'd be great if you picked up, if you live in the San Diego, if you picked, if you chose to pick it up in store, because we'd love to see you come into the store and shop with us. We have, um, well, we have wonderful book selection. There's a whole other side of the store that has wonderful gifts and beautiful jewelry, antique jewelry and pens and fine leather. So we'd love to see you. Uh, of course, we're doing all of the protocol of masks and social distancing. So we're keeping everybody safe. So. It's time to think about shopping and, and holidays. So we'd love to see you come on into Warwick's and shop with us and browse and browse those wonderful books. But why we all are here this afternoon, um, we're here to celebrate the launch of the Green Lace Corset with Jill G. Hall. She is the award-winning author of a dual timeline trilogy about women searching for their place in the world connected by vintage finds. 
These are um, these are uh, antique button jewelry. So you might have a, a, a find there too one of these days, Jill. <laughs> the black velvet coat and the silver shoes are best-selling book club favorites. The third in the series, the green lace corset was recently released. She's an instructor at San Diego Writers Inc. as well as a seasoned presenter at readings and community events. In addition to writing, she fashions whimsical mosaics using found objects like the character Annie in her novels. The Green Lace Corset is about modern day artist Anne McFarland, buys a vintage corset in a resale boutique, which leads to a chain of events that forces her to make the biggest decision of her life. More than a century earlier, Sally Sue Sullivan, a young woman in 1885 is kidnapped by a handsome outlaw and taken by train to Arizona's Wild West. Both women find the strength to overcome their fears and discover the true meaning of family with a little push from a green lace corset. BuzzFeed listed it as a new historical fiction book you won't want to put down this fall. Before we begin, before we bring on the, uh, what, ah, sorry, I got a little twisted there. Before we bring on the author, one of Jill's best friends would like to entertain you. The wonderful Phil Johnson is an actor, playwright, and artistic director of Roustabouts Theater Company, currently streaming the highly acclaimed one-man show, portraying Theodore Roosevelt in Charge the Bear. Take it away, Phil. Uh, she'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Yee! She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. I'm looking for her. She'll be coming round the mountain. She'll be coming round the mountain. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. I'm looking. She'll be riding six white horses when she comes. I don't see her. She'll be riding six white horses when she... Tar Nation, if it doesn't look like Jill G. Hall herself. How are you, Jill? I'm great. Hi, Phil. Thanks for being here. Oh, you're welcome. You're so welcome. We've been neighbors for so long. We've been friends for a long, long time. And we met on Mead Avenue and University Heights. So we've had a long past history. Yes, a lot of creative adventures together and creative. supporting each other. And right. it's so great for us to, to now be together celebrating the release of my third novel. I know, I'm so excited, so proud of you. So now we got to take a look at that outfit, Jill. Oh, are you sure? Okay. Sure. Oh. Oh. Beautiful. You like a glamorous Miss Kitty from Gunsmoke. Oh, that's fantastic. A little racy, Jill. I know, but you can all handle it. <laughs> so tell us a little about the outfit. Okay. Well, it's really, I got it here inspired from a picture that I saw on Pinterest. Mm -hmm. And I had started writing a story uh, about Sally Sue Sullivan. And, um, and I thought about if she saw this course that I was researching 1885 vintage clothes, and this popped up. And I thought, Oh, my gosh, here she is in, a, in a Flagstaff, Arizona, and the 1885. And what would she think if she saw that. And um, so I wanted to have it uh, made for me so I could wear it to my events. And um, so I, you referred me to Jordan Smiley, who is a local um, she play, uh, costume designer. And she does them for lots of theaters here in town. And she also teaches at Mesa College mm -hmm. how to make costumes and fashion design. Uh, and she put together this whole outfit for me and um, then uh, I also had her make me, when COVID hit, I was so disappointed because I wouldn't be able to wear this to my event, but here we are. <laughs> and for other events, I am actually, get, I've just scheduled a parking lot uh, signing and I will be wearing my mask. She made a mask for me. So here we are. I love it. You could have a glamorous quarantine. Yes, glamorous quarantine. And uh, so this is uh, where we are today. We're doing it on Zoom and Facebook Live and we're getting the books out there. It's fantastic. Now, how did, how did the uh, Green Lace Corset get on the cover? Okay, well, um, for my other two, two books, I also had uh, a say in that. And I, my publisher, She Writes Press is amazing. They're 
um, mission driven to support women authors and teach us how to be entrepreneurs. And part of that is they encourage us to be involved in all of the creative things such as decision making on what the title of the book would be and also the cover. And they, they give you a form that you fill out and you tell them the color that you want, the style, the what you might want on the cover and what your vision is and then they put it together. So for um, the black velvet coat, I actually have a coat that I sent to them. And Julie Metz, here is the coat right here. And um, she took, took photos. I sent it to the East Coast to where Julie Metz lives. And it's on the cover of this. And then my silver shoes for the cover of the silver shoes. Here they are. These are the shoes that we used for the book cover. And it's so fun. And then I wore these to all my these to all my events, the coat and the shoes. And here we are today in my little beautiful yeah. stuff. Now there were yes. beautiful pictures of you earlier in the newspapers. That wonderful uh, uh, article about you and the pictures in the UT. Uh, now we all know what was under the uh, black velvet coat. So let's see the article. Oh my God! Could they have made the picture any bigger? Are you on the cover? Wow. Here we are. You're famous. <laughs> You're a celebrity. Yes. Now, yes. Tell everybody about the photo shoot for this. What did you do for that? Okay. Well, the photo shoot was just amazing. So Jen Coburn, my publicist, said because of the pandemic, we really need to be able to, to uh, get the attention of, of um, articles. And uh, we want some great photos for you to use on Facebook and for uh, pitching your story to the uh, papers. And so she always pushes me to, to be my best. And she said, we've got to have a great photo shoot. Right. So we met uh, with the, the, the gentleman, our friend who did our my photo for the black velvet coat, who's a friend of Phil's, does all the theater people in town. And um, we invited him out to my property in Descanso. And um, then also Alvi Alvarado came and did my makeup. And uh, we just had an amazing magical day. And uh, the sun was bright and shining. And it's really um, wonderful what bright light, natural light can do. And, um, and also makeup for a girl. <laughs> <laughs> right. so, I'm really grateful for that. Yes, yes. 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 Now, this, this book is part of a trilogy. It's the Anne McFarland Trilogy. And do we need to read the other two books before we, before I read this, The Green Lace Corset? No, no. So all three of the books stand alone. So you can read them in any order. And um, so if somebody, for instance, wants to read The Green Lace Corset first, they can read it. And there's just a little bit of a thread that ties, it, ties it, puts them together, because Anne is in all three books, a San Francisco artist. But if you want to read the third book first, that's fine. And then if you like my writing style, you can go back and read the other ones as prequels. Great, great. Now you do what's called dual timelines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little, about, a little bit about that? And is that hard to do? Yes. Well, dual timeline means that you have two time periods going at the same time. And as an author, uh, you have to weave them back and forth and back and forth and figure it all out. So when I first wrote my first novel, uh, The Black Velvet Coat, I had no idea I was writing a dual timeline. I thought that I was writing two different books. And so um, then at one point, when both of the characters were involved in The Black Velvet Coat, I re having it, I realized it was one book. And it was like a big mosaic trying to figure out the different scenes and, and where everything would go. And um, so it's very complicated. And in all three of my um, novels, it's, they're all three about women trying to find their place in the world connected by vintage finds. Great, great. Yes. Thank well, you Phil, me. Phil, thank you for joining me. And um, it's, it's time for you to go. So and, soon? Yes, I'm sorry, but we've got other, you know, other things to, to do and talk about and exciting guests. All right, I guess I gotta go. I'll be going round the mountain when I come. I'll be going round the okay, mountain. Okay, thanks. I'll be going round the Okay, you can go now.
Thanks. Okay, thanks, Phil. That was great. Um, let's give him a round of applause. And if you uh, want to, he is currently streaming his one man show, as we said earlier, about Theodore Roosevelt. And uh, so the information will be posted um, on the comment section on how you can see it. And I really encourage all of you to tune in and see it, especially if you need a change from Netflix. Um, and uh, the, it's really an interesting show because right now it's really important because his play is about what makes a, a strong leader. Uh, and there are a lot of parallels between what was going, in, going on in that era and also today. So um, I'm gonna tell you all about how I started writing the Green Lace Corset. Um, I was in a workshop at San Diego Writers Inc. and I was given the prompt, you're riding on a train. And I started writing and it was a timed writing. And so I just went for it and I just kept going. And I got, after a while, I got into the rhythm, like I was really riding on a train. And then when the timer went off and it was 20 minutes, I uh, read my piece out loud and I actually had a story with a beginning, middle and end. It was a Western romantic tale. Um, and so I couldn't wait to get home and type it up. So I got home and I typed it up and it was too um, short for a flash fiction, which is a really short piece. And it was, um, it, when it was too, too long for a flash fiction and too short for a short story. And I was working on the silver shoes at the time. So I put it aside um, and just put it in a folder and put it in my, my um, drawer. And there it sat for a while. And um, then when I finished that, I came back and I started, uh, when I finished the silver shoes and it was launched, uh, the story kept coming back to me and I started writing it again. And I had no idea it would be part of the trilogy. It just, uh, that's how it turned out. So I'm gonna read to you right now um, from chapter eight in uh, the Green Lace Corset. Uh, and this is about, um, it's 1885, and innocent Sally Sue Sullivan has been kidnapped by Cliff, a handsome outlaw, and taken on a train to Flagstaff. She's in shock from the situation in the Wild West town. Cliff had asked the hotel proprietor to keep an eye on her and not to pay attention to any outrageous stories that she might tell him. So here we go. Cliff started down the street back toward the hotel. Here comes your husband now, the hotel owner said. A redwood came out of the saloon and stood on the porch. Yoo-hoo, she called to Cliff in a southern drawl. He changed direction and walked toward the woman who fluttered her eyes at him and put her hands on the back lace of her hips. Was that what Sally Sue's ma had meant by a harlot, the kind of woman her father had left them for? She glared at Cliff, sat and crossed her arms. Did men do offensive things with them, like the Bible said? Sally Sue should have been appalled, but instead she was mesmerized. She imagined what it would feel like to be dressed in something so sinful and parade in front of men. The feel of lace on her chest and thighs, the smoothness of the satin. This, the green one, was a low cut corset with a skirt and a giant bustle in back. What would mama say if she knew Sally Sue had these thoughts? What would Johnny Jones and his mother back home think if she sauntered into the church hall for a dance dressed in that? She smiled. Would he ask her to dance? Certainly Pastor Grimes would grab a coat, cover her up and whisk her home to mama. Now I, I'd like to introduce another special guest who will be joining me, the talented Lee Aiken, an award-winning director, singer, actor, visual artist, and illustrator, who I'm happy to say also happens to be my personal assistant. Lee, come on in. Hi. Hi there. Congratulations, Jill. 
Thank you. Thank you for all your help and support trying to get this book out. I really appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. Um, and if anybody watching this does not currently um, receive the email blasts that, um, that Jill sends out and you want to have updates on her upcoming books, on other blogs that she's doing, um, all of her fun events, um, I'm going to post a link in the chat um, section of the Facebook Live event right now so that you can be sure to, um, to subscribe and see all those links and, um, and join us for, for all of her upcoming events. So, yeah, so um, enough, uh, enough promo. Uh, do you, um, do you want to talk a little bit more about the Green Lace Corset, Jill? Yes, okay. Um, we're going to talk about uh, how I was inspired uh, by mm -hmm. nature, and yeah. um, so I've spent a lot of time, as much time as possible, out on my property in Descanso, and it's a 45-minute drive from downtown San Diego, and out there I have a studio, and I make art there, my mosaics, and um, I also write. Uh, it's very quiet. I can hear my characters. And I also host occasional day retreats for other creatives. Um, and nature out there has really inspired my poetry and novel scenes, um, as well as my art. And you saw a lot of pictures in the, in the film earlier on, those pictures I took um, from out there. Um, and it's, they're just filled with lots of plants and, and natives and, and oak and pine trees and uh, and lots of animals, deer, coyote, and wild turkeys, and those animals all made it into the books. Um, mm -hmm. And so also, I attended school in Flagstaff, Arizona. And uh, so that's where in the book, we, the characters end up in, par in Flagstaff. And um, uh, the, it's, it's also very similar, but bigger. The mountains there are really, really huge. So when twice as big actually as uh, out in San Diego. And so I um, really, as I was writing the book, I was at the J&J &J Ranch and inspired by the nature there, but I thought about it so much bigger and what it would have been like in 1885 to be out on a homestead in the middle of nowhere and how Sally Sue would feel and what she would see and how she would be encountering the nature also. And her awe is my awe as, as I wrote the book. I could really feel her awe. Mm, that's lovely. And, and Sally Sue is, um, is, in the, um, is in the past timeline of the book of the yes, two- 1885 in uh, Very, Northern Arizona, ter Arizona Territory uh, outside of Flagstaff. Amazing. So let's switch gears now, Lee, and um, we're going to read um, from chapter one, when Anne McFarland, the present day artist, finds the corset. Mm -hmm. As she continued along Flagstaff's wooden sidewalk, the window of Greeley's resale boutique's shop caught her attention. A mustache mannequin in full cowboy regalia, Stetson hat, checkered shirt with snaps, and suede fringed chaps was posed beside a rusty wagon wheel and a life-size plastic cow. Searching for found treasures was one of her passions. Sometimes she'd find a little something for herself, as well as objects for her artwork, still selling well at Galerie Noir. Anne stepped inside to the tinkling of a bell. A straw aroma from the hay bale strewn around for ambiance tickled her nose. Morning. From behind the counter, a girl looked up from her books with a smile. She wore a Northern Arizona University t-shirt. Her blonde braids hung down over it. Can I help you? Just looking. I was all, it was all in the hunt. Anne always let her intuition guide her. I'm Lola. Let me know if you need anything. The girl returned to her studies. Anne looked through a basket of bandanas and flipped through a clothes rack. The 1950s tulle prom dress, the sequined Mexican shawl, and the faded gingham dress didn't do much for her. 
but she held her breath when she spotted a green lace corset. Black lace from the bodice, top edge, and moved down its front. A short flouncy skirt rested over it. Both pieces were the same color as her favorite cocktail dress, the one she'd had on the night she met Sergio. The corset appeared to be from the 1800s, something Miss Kitty might have worn in that old TV show, Gunsmoke, a true vintage piece. Rarely could something this old be discovered in a resale shop, especially in such a good shape. Anne pulled the hanger off the rack, held the corset up to the light and checked for moth holes and tears. Some of the lace had become loose, but Anne could easily mend it. She ran her hand along the smooth satin and fingered the hooks that marched down the corset center. She fantasized about what it would feel like for Sergio to unlatch the hooks one at a time slowly. It had been months since she'd seen him. He called occasionally, but when he did, she felt sadder and lonelier than ever. She shook her head. She should be over him by now. A country song played. How do I live without you? I want to know. She How do I live without you? She didn't remember the singer's name, but she liked the twang and the lyrics. Her eyes welled up. She never knew when a song would hit her. Want to try it on? Lola asked from the counter. Anne blinked away tears, shook off her emotions and turned around. How much for the set? She searched for a price tag, but found none. Lola opened a ledger and scanned a page. Don't know. I need to call the owner. Want to try it on in the meantime? Sure. Anne couldn't pass up this opportunity. Lola took the garment from her, led her to the back of the shop, and hung the corset on a screen. Just give a holler if you need help. Behind the screen, Anne slipped out of her boots, jeans, and sweater. She unpinned the pieces, stepped into the skirt, and tied the side bows. She pulled the corset around her and connected the front metal hooks. Good thing she hadn't gained back the weight she'd lost last year after their breakup. Without all that yoga, the hooks would never have closed. She wished she had fishnet stockings to wear with the outfit. As Anne slid back into her black boots, she heard Lola on the phone asking, How much for the satin green saloon number? It's only a hundred dollars, Lola called. Let me see. Anne stepped out from behind the screen. Lola's eyes lit up. It's made for you. Here. Anne turned Would around. You Would you please put in the back the laces for me? Lola tugged on them until they were snug. Thanks. Anne leaned over and stuck her hand down the front twice, lifting each breast. Gotta help the girls up. Lola's eyes grew wide. Never seen that trick before. Bet it on a blog somewhere. Anne studied her reflection in the standing mirror. Nice, a sexy hint of cleavage showed. She thrust out a hip and drawled. What can I do for you, fellas? Lola laughed. Anne handed Lola her phone and Lola snapped a few photos. Anne set her palms over the lace bows on the hips and slid her fingers down the satin below her belly button. A pale glow emanated within her and swirled slowly. The intoxicating aroma of sage filled the air. It had been so long since she could miss Sergio. She just had to get over him. Maybe they weren't meant to be, but she now longed for a connection with someone special, someone who would appreciate a green lace corset like this. Do you take credit cards? She asked. Um, so like Anne, you are also an artist. Um, and you use found objects for your mosaics, some of which I have seen, they're all beautiful. Um, how did that help you develop some of the scenes with Anne? Um, well, 
what what I've done is I've taken the idea of found of mosaics and I've used them to either move the story along or as clues to maybe what was going on or had happened with the person in the past. And um, so what I've done is I've made some of these pieces in real life and other pieces that I describe in the book, I actually um, maybe made them after I had written the scene and then others were just in my imagination. Um, so I'm gonna tell you about a couple of those now. Anne um, is actually an instructor at the um, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And so she came up with um, a, one of my favorite um, projects that I like to do with people, uh, groups of people are um, Lucky Horseshoes. And I know some of you out there have your own that you've made with me. And uh, so they're using found objects and they're old horseshoes that have already been used and, and we mosaic them together. So Anne had her students make those in the book. And then also um, she has a, um, uh, is applying for a fellowship and she mm -hmm. needs to do uh, a big, big project. So she decides she's going to do a giant deer uh, with concrete. And uh, in my book, one of the, the, the themes is, and you noticed in the video earlier, there, there's a thing about deer. So the deers would come all the time down and Sally Sue would like seeing them. And, um, and Anne thinks that, that maybe that is a, a soul, you know, in her own work, she's thinking maybe deer is a, one of her soul um, and, and totems uh, animals. And so um, she decides to take this really big concrete thing and she's, and I've made concrete pieces that are smaller where they were concrete and then I had to cover them. But with a deer, I came up with all these things where she's crawling underneath it, trying to figure out how to get the pieces underneath and, and all over. So, um, so I had a lot of fun writing about that. And another uh, piece that Anne makes in the book that I made in real life, I was looking around my studio, oh, I need another piece for Anne. And all of a sudden I looked, I saw this piece in there that I had made and it's called You Glow Girl. And there was, um, we did a show at uh, Inspirations in the Ink Spot Gallery as part of uh, Writers Inc. And the prompt was uh, light. And so I had made this piece and you can see, I don't know if you can see the details, but in the middle I have this girl with turquoise hair. And then I have um, bottle caps that I got at a um, bed and breakfast uh, that we were, I was staying in once. And um, there's also little refrigerator magnet, uh, magnets with words on it. So, um, so I have, Anne actually makes it and it, it ends up being in a special place at the, towards the end of the book. Um, mm -hmm. So I really, really enjoyed that. And a lot of my artwork can be seen on my website or maybe um, also I have a lot of on my Pinterest uh, site. So you can go and look at, at some more of those. And um, at, in um, Liberty Station where we have San Diego Writers Inc. We're closed down now, but we're getting ready in December. We're gonna start an online um, uh, things so people can go online and purchase artwork uh, from local artists through that. That's really exciting. So you didn't actually make a giant deer while in no, preparation? I okay. didn't and I won't. It was hard enough for me to do it in fiction that to yeah. really try to do it in reality would be difficult. Yeah, but you feel like your your artwork definitely informs your writing. Oh yeah. Um, in fact, you called yourself an intuitive writer and an intuitive artist. Um, do you want to give a little bit more um, background into what you mean or or what that process is like yeah, for you? Well, sure. So what happens is um, with me when I'm doing my mosaics, I I usually start with a base. And then mm -hmm. I go for it. And I have a, my, my art studio, I have tons of found objects. And I just start picking and choosing things that are called to that specific piece, uh, base. And um, what happens too is that um, sometimes I'll have a prompt, just like in writing. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's uh, like that, the new glow girl light was the prompt. Um, so for writing, 
I had to, I had no idea when I left teaching after 20 years that I was really going to write novels. I thought I was going to write children's books or maybe uh, a memoir about being a teacher, but that's not what happened at all. I uh, started going to Brown Bag uh, drop-in group with Judy Reeves, and she taught me how to write intuitively. She believes in the heart-hand connection, and we'd have a prompt, and we'd write, I, and I still do this, I write everything in my journal first, and uh, just let whatever comes out, comes out. And after a while, characters started to appear from nowhere. And that's how I do all of that. And I'm so grateful to Judy. Um, and she's taught many of us how to write intuitively. And the, the Greenlease corset is actually dedicated to, to her. And oh, wow. we're, all of us in San Diego are so grateful to, to Judy. So, and then after I've done, um, have a lot of journals, I start typing up pages that are worthy. And then I, you know, work, start massaging the story. And I start to do the historical research then and fact checking and coloring the story. That's exciting. Um, I do actually see that Judy Reeves is, um, is watching on Facebook Live right now. She's, Hi, Judy. Um, <laughs> it's actually really exciting. There's um, more than 50 people there right now who are watching it. So um, great. Really Good. Hi. That's <laughs> <laughs> I'm sort of slacking on my duties to post links, but I'll, I'll be sure to catch up and make sure that everybody has all of your, um, your Facebook links and your, um, and your website links. Um, but in the meantime, what do, you, what do you hope your writers will get um, out of reading this book? Um, what do well, you... I hope that they also realize that life can be complicated and it's unpredictable. And also that there are different kinds of love and different kinds of families. Uh, and they're, and that's okay, and that's good. That's a good thing. And also, um, I really hope at this time that people can read my books and have a respite uh, mm -hmm. and curl up and and get away in the you know be in another world and uh, and enjoy their the time doing that. Exactly. So, um, Lee, I think it's about time we probably start taking some questions from in the comments section. And if yeah. you have a question, go ahead and type it in. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, let's see here. Okay, here's one. Um, how have you, um, how have you taken those prompts that you use for your art and your, um, and your writing? Do you ever bring them into other works of art that you do? Like, do you use, do you use prompts for, um, for other um, means of expression in your day-to-day -day life? Well, I do, I write a lot of poetry. So I use prompts for, for poetry. And a lot of times when I'm working to a prompt, I don't know if, if a character's gonna come out or if the poem's gonna be there. And sometimes it's a personal experience too that'll come out on there, um, so yeah. And typically, where do you get the prompts from? Do you have a like? Do you have a book? Do you, do they just like come to you? Um... Well, I still um, so I still go to Tuesday Brown Bag, and I'm co-facilitating that right now. And uh, we're on Zoom. We transitioned everything to Zoom through Riot, San Diego Writers Inc. So if anybody wants to come write with me on Tuesdays at twelve o'clock uh, Pacific time, come on and join us through San Diego Writers Inc. And uh, so you can check in with me about that. Also, um, I uh, get them, um, I use a lot of other things. You can, you can look around and get them. A lot of times I'll look out at nature. Uh, I also really recommend Judy's book, Judy Reeves book, A Writer's Book of Days. It has a prompt for every day. And I always recommend new writers get that book and start writing to those prompts. Mm, yeah. Um, also, I should just mention to everybody who's watching along, if you um, if you have questions, you can type them right into the comment section of the Facebook. Um, you mentioned that you were um, that you were actually a student at Flagstaff, which which I didn't realize. So when you started writing this trilogy, did you did you know that that's where this would all end up, or did it kind of take you by surprise that Anne and her like you know her uh, dual timeline for this ended up in Flagstaff, Arizona? Well, this is really what was exciting to me was I, um, as I said earlier, I had started writing the book 
uh, in that one workshop. And mm -hmm. um, she was, uh, Sally Sue was from the Midwest and they got on the train in the Midwest. And it was in 1885, it was in the 1800s. I knew that, I didn't know exactly when. And then I really started to, and then I got the outfit and what year would the outfit be? And then I said, okay, where is she gonna get off? Where did she get on the train? And where did she get off? So it's can around Kansas City is where I ended up, where there's train. I had to look at where trains went in that era. And yeah. actually it was exciting because there was this train stop in Flagstaff. And I was so excited because actually Flagstaff is in my first novel in the Black Velvet Code. And it was a significant part of that. So I was able to bring, you know, Anne there to Flagstaff uh, sort of on a pilgrimage in the beginning. And that's when she found the corset. And then that's where they ended up. So I was so happy because I love Flagstaff. And, mm -hmm. and the San Francisco peaks there are amazing. Just looking up from down below. And I, I could really picture that. And when I was there, I lived in the, in the dorms and I could look up at the peak every day. And so that was the view. And then from my property, I have a smaller peak, but there's still you know, a peak there. To inspire you. Um, we have a question, How? what is one of the more difficult parts of writing um, a book or bringing a book into publication that you'd like to mention? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, for this, these specific books, the hard part I had was keeping Anne's character relevant, mm -hmm. especially to technology. So when I started writing it uh, years ago, the first one, uh, there wasn't, there wasn't really most of the technology wasn't there. So I had to add in emails and phone calls and, and more of that. Then when we started texting, I add, for the next book, I added in texting and Skype dates. And, and uh, those, so I would I'd try to keep up with the technology and I'd have to go back in and write it. So I have in this one, uh, in the Green Lace Corset, um, I've got uh, Alexa. I better be careful because she's over <laughs> Alexa uh, in um, Anne's apartment. <laughs> so for you, it was it was difficult to sort of keep the um, keep the books in keeping with the modern um, technological world mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as you're as you're going along. Yeah, and then people would say, "Well, have you traveled to those places in, that were, you know, in the past?" And I'm like, "Well, you know, for me to go to certain cities like Kansas City, if I would go to Kansas City right now to to research it, it would be totally different than how it mm -hmm. is. So I looked at vintage photos and yeah. I do get, actually I get a lot of prompts from looking at vintage photos too. And I do That's that mostly on Pinterest. They have, uh, it's really an easy way to get really great, uh, see vintage photos. That's good. That makes me feel less guilty about all the time I spend on Pinterest. Um, <laughs> I. I have um, one more question here from um, from um, my dear aunt Lynn Cooper, who's with us, um, and she's wondering if you can, and maybe you do, maybe you don't want to divulge. Um, can you kindly tell us about your next book? Is well, Anne in it? I don't. I'm hoping Anne's not in it. I think okay. <laughs> I, I feel like this is a trilogy, and it needs to. I think I'm finished, but you never know. So I should never say never with Anne, mm -hmm. but she's gonna hopefully sit the next one out. And I'm working on uh, a novel that's very exciting. It's about a real woman who lived in Point Loma here near where I live. And uh, she was started a um, retreat place or actually a school for children. And she was into the philosophy and uh, the occult. And so I'm really having a great time uh, working on that. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, I've got another question. Um, what is the process of writing this book like in comparison to others? Has it become easier as you've gone along? Did you find that the third one was easier than the first two? I had more self-confidence that, yeah, I can do this. I had more self-confidence about it. I was able to let go more. I didn't worry about, I've really learned, and this was one of the hardest things for an author to do, is to learn just to go for it and not worry if anyone's gonna like it. Just let your heart tell you and your intuition tell you this is what's supposed to happen then. 
And then I do a leap of faith and I give it to an editor and I let the editor or my read and critique group give me feedback on it, but just mm -hmm. get it down and just keep going. And so it's gotten easier in terms of, yeah, I can do this. You, you glow girl yeah. <laughs> kind of a feeling. Yeah. I do think that that's such a big part of the process is just believing in yourself mm -hmm. um, is saying that, yes, I can put this out into the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Um, somebody says they don't have a question, but oh no, um, they have a question. How do you look so amazing? That's off the oh. seat. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> As uh, I said earlier, it's amazing what good lighting and, and make, <laughs> makeup artists can do. <laughs> Very cool. Um, let's so see I here. Think, I think we're about ready to finish up. Yeah, Maybe that sounds like good. Ready? Okay. So, um, Thank you so much, Lee, for being here with me today. Thank it was you for really special. Part of this. Really Very special. Fun. Congratulations um, again. Yeah. And I'll, I'll post all of your links onto the um, the Facebook comment section right now. Great. So. And if anybody needs any, if you have any specific questions of a link you want, because we've talked about a lot, uh, ask uh, Lee for it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so now, Julie, will you will you come back and join us again? And uh, Great, and explain how to buy the book. Yeah, well, I have the book pinned in the um, comment section. So like I said earlier, go ahead and pin that, or you can click on that to order it. But also I wanted to mention that um, for every book purchased through Warwick's, uh, Jill's giving a donation to the San Diego Arts and Culture Challenge Fund. You wanna tell us a little bit about that, Jill? Yes, yes. So um, in March, partnering with the San Diego Foundation, uh, the San Diego Arts and Culture Challenge was created as an initiative to help stabilize the creative sector and save jobs and help lessen the financial losses due to COVID-19. And in May, we granted 32 organizations $250,000 to small nonprofit arts and culture organizations um, to help uh, support their creatives. And um, then recently, uh, we were able for phase two, we gave um, 120 artists $1,000 grants directly to them to it for emergency purposes. Many are using it for rent, for um, food, for um, medical. And we felt we're so proud of that. And now we're getting geared up for phase three. And we've been offered $70,000 from the Parker Foundation uh, and we need to get a match by the end of the year. So we're on a tight time frame. Yeah. And uh, then we're, our goal is to be able to, to raise $250,000 and wow. uh, help our mid-sized nonprofits. Those are the ones that we found really need support. So uh, any, if you can um, you know, buy my book and I'll be giving a donation towards the, this, or if you feel so moved, um, feel free to, uh, to donate to the cause. Donate directly. Wow, what a fantastic, I mean, that is, congratulations, that is amazing and fantastic. You have a very generous heart. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'm wondering if Lee maybe wants to put a link into the challenge if people do feel obligated, or, or you know, if they're not, but if they feel so moved to, to donate directly, um, if there's a, an easy link to that too. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to mention too, um, Jill, that all these, co you've gotten some wonderful comments on the Facebook page. Oh, and so can you, can you, I'd love to see them. All. You could go back to Warwick's Facebook page. They will stay there and you can okay. see them all. And, and there's wonderful, you have wonderful people out there watching. So thank you everybody for watching. Yeah. And I'm so grateful for those, for all of you who've been here today. And um, I just, I'm just so in awe that my career is, is where it is and what's happened and, and you've all been, many of you have been so helpful to me and I appreciate it. Well, you've got a lot of love in the comment section. So that's and, good, got a, got a lot of good vibes coming your way. <laughs> and, and, and Julie, thank you and Warwick so much for having me today. Absolutely, it's our pleasure. It was a wonderful conversation and event. And so thank you for being here. And so thank you and I'll thank everybody too. So. For those of you, we're going to kind of sign off a little bit here, but we're also going to show um, for your viewing pleasure, if you'd like to stay on, if you came in late, uh, we're going to reshow the video now. So we will show that. And with that, Jill, thank you. Bye. She'll be coming round the mountain when 
she comes She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes She'll be coming round the mountain Blowing steam off like a fountain She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. She'll be riding six white horses when she comes. She'll be riding six white horses when she comes. She'll be riding six white horses. She'll be riding six white horses. She'll be riding six white horses when she comes. Oh, we'll all go out to meet her when she comes. When she comes. Oh, we'll all go out to meet her when she comes. When she comes. Oh, we'll all go out to meet her and we'll all be glad to see her. Oh, we'll all go out to meet her when she comes. When she comes, oh, we'll kill the old red rooster when she comes. Oh, we'll kill the old red rooster, cause he don't grow like he used to. Oh, we'll kill the old red rooster when she comes. And we'll all have chicken and dumplings when she comes. Oh, we'll all have chicken and dumplings when she comes. Oh, we'll all have chicken and dumplings, cause we'll all have chicken and dumplings. Oh, we'll all have chicken and dumplings when she comes. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming round the mountain. She'll be coming round the mountain. She'll be coming round the mountain. When she comes